right. I love this series. Uh, I've been a pastor now two years, and I thought, you know, somewhere, maybe like eight, nine, ten years from now, I'll preach through Revelation. And so here I am, <laughs> only two years into it, and I'm going through Revelation. It came up. I feel like it's where we should be. And I have the luxury of preaching two series from Revelation because I'm preaching one in Iola at night and uh, one here in the afternoon. And it's been really cool because I can go back and catch some things there that I uh, didn't bring out here. So, so like I'm, I'm preaching right, like when we did the uh, seven churches, you know, uh, I didn't spend much time talking about who the angels of the seven churches were. And that's the message tonight in Iola. So if you get a chance to, to watch some of those, we try we do a live stream, but later on we try to uh, upload the recording on, on YouTube. If you get a chance and you want to follow along with that, uh, just kind of see where we're going, that might be helpful. But here we come to what I believe is pretty much the most important part of understanding end times prophecy. I don't pretend by any... Uh, stretch of the imagination that I've got it all figured out and I know exactly what's going to happen and that I'm right and everyone else is wrong, uh, not by a long shot. But I do believe that I got some key things down that are spelled out very clearly in this uh, chapter that match up with the rest of the Bible to a T. And if you don't get this right, I think it really confuses you. And this is where a lot of the, the error comes, I think, in understanding some of these events. And I understand where it comes from. Uh, I've been taught and believe myself differently for, for many years, but it's one of those things. Like I explained one time about the magic eye, you know, you'd stare at it and stare at it and you're like, I don't get it. I don't get it. And then once you see it, you can't unsee it. Like, you know, no, I know what it, I know what it looks like. I need to tell everybody else. <laughs> and so that's what, uh, uh, that's what we have come to. Last week, we talked about the new song. All right, so they've been singing holy, holy, holy. I mean, every I think the elders and the cherubim on a regular basis, probably 24 hours a day, singing some kind of song un, unto the Lord. You know, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and, 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 they're, and they're just praising His name. But then what we see is that John sees a vision of this new song that's talking about this seal. You remember John saw the, this, uh, this book and it's sealed up, and he said, nobody can open up the book. And maybe in his dream state or whatever, I don't know, he starts crying about it, <laughs> right? But then all of a sudden, it's just all joy in heaven because they say, worthy is the lamb, you know, to be able to open these seals. And, and there's just like, it seems like this great celebration in heaven. And we talked about the fact that, could you imagine if you knew, I mean, we're not even in, in we're not in heaven, but even in our physical state right here, if you knew 100%, hey, seven years and we'll be in the kingdom. And it starts today. Wouldn't that be exciting? I mean, the, the countdown begins today. You got seven years and we'll be in the kingdom. I think we would be rejoicing to know that the countdown has begun. And that's what's going on here. There's a, this image that he sees that's kind of an a, 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 a interesting image, although we see it other, other places in the Bible as well, is this, this scroll that's sealed. Okay, Daniel was told, in fact, we'll look at this here in a few minutes, but Daniel was told to seal up, you know, the, the writings that he got. And here, we're, we want to do the opposite. We're wanting to, to unseal this thing, reveal it. And, uh, and, and so this is, you know, t some 2,000 years later after, uh, uh, you know, John gets this revelation. All this, you know, we're so much closer to it actually, this actually happening uh, than we've ever been, of course. And so the points of the seal is this. This is where people get confused. They're like seven seals, you know, seven, and they confuse that. And, and, and they get all these mixed up. And sometimes seven is such a, uh, an important factor. And I'll say this, seven comes up a lot in the book of Revelation. So you can kind of see where Schofield's notes is just constantly just keying in on sevens. <laughs> There's a seven. And uh, he kind of goes overboard and leads people astray. Just read your Bible and just ignore the, the footnotes every once in a while <laughs> and, uh, and take in what God's Word has to say. That'll help you out. Okay, but, uh, but the purpose of the seal, the seven seals, and I want to try to explain this. So this is a scroll. I know it says book, and no, I'm not 
changing the word of God or teaching some kind of heresy or something like that. But the, but the, the way that they had books back then was kind of like in scroll form. Now, if you want to believe that it was a book, like a, what do they call this, codex form, that's fine. You can believe that, and maybe that's the was it. It's not going to change any of these events, okay? But I think it was a, a, what was uh, we would call a scroll, but over and over in the Bible from the very beginning to the end, uses the word book. You know, that could mean different things. Sometimes it says a roll, right? The word scroll is only used a couple times, but, uh, but the idea is, is a book, okay? And somewhere in, uh, what is it? I think Isaiah says the roll of the book. And so there, that combines both of them together. And in this book, I don't think it's codex form. I think it's the scroll. There are seven seals, okay? Now, typically a seal is thought of in those days, they would put some kind of like wax or something like that, and they would have a ring, and they would put the signet. You see that several times in the Bible. It could be that kind of seal. I don't know. But there's seven of them, and, uh, and there's something that is hard to, for them to open. Okay? And so sometimes I've demonstrated this by like rubber bands or something like that just to get this idea. Now, some have said that perhaps it was like you scroll down a little bit, and then there's another seal. And then you scroll down a little bit and you just keep on going until you get past the seven seals. I don't see it that way because I believe, you know, and we're going to go through this here in a minute, but I believe here is the idea. There is an event that is written on the inside of this that everybody wants to know what's going to happen. And this event can't be seen by everybody until all those seals are passed. Okay. And, uh, and so, one by one, in this vision, Jesus is going to re remove these seals from the, from the book. And then when the seventh seal is open, something unique is going to happen, okay? That's different from all those uh, events that are explained in those seals. Hope that makes sense. I think probably uh, you, you understand where I'm going with that. Okay, so uh, let's look at Revelation 8 for a minute. We're going to be in Revelation 6, so hold your place there. But Revelation 8, we see what's going to happen after these seals have been removed. And this is kind of like the climax of the opening of this book, okay? And so look at Revelation chapter 8. Starting verse 1, it says, And when they had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now these trumpets are going to be judgments that are poured out. We'll get to that down the road. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayer of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God, out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. And then it goes and it talks about the, each of these trumpets. But, but they're getting in a position here. And they're getting ready. And there's these incense and there, there's a space of... Uh, uh, how did it say? There's a space of a half an hour. There's silence in heaven. Okay, so I mean, this is just a huge deal. They've already been singing, and they've been, you know, uh, uh, looking forward to all the events that are going to take place. And once those events are out of the way, they're going to open. There's going to be the opening of the book, and all these, uh, uh, and the, the, these events are going to come to pass. But before you get there, you've got to go through these seals. Okay, and this is what the message is about uh, this afternoon. Now, after these seals, let me just explain real quickly in advance, because we'll go through these, uh, the judgments later on. But we're going to see all these judgments, which would be called the wrath of God, that's being poured out onto the earth. Okay, And during that time, uh, Christians are gone, as we'll see. But we're actually, it appears like in heaven, watching these things unfold. Okay, This is like the great, I mean, you... You know, you like watching football or some kind of spectator sports or whatever. Man, this is like the ultimate. You're up in heaven. You're watching the winning team. All right, you're actually on the winning team. You already know it. <laughs> and God is is uh, got his uh, Jesus got his angels 
and they're pouring out the judgments on the earth and all that kind of stuff. That's what that's what the Bible seems to indicate. Okay, uh, but during the time that the the God's wrath is going to be poured out, this is again after the book is open. We're not there yet, but when that happens and the, all these uh, uh, judgments are going to be poured out, we see an interesting thing here, and that is that all the people we don't see God's people on the earth. All we see are people who continue to reject uh, the Lord. Okay, let's look at Revelation chapter 9, verse 20. Revelation 9, verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their, uh, of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silvers and uh, silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murderers, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Now look, when you go back to the, the, the last seal, the sixth seal, you're going to see people saying, the great day of the Lord has come. Hide us from His wrath. And they're hiding in mountains and all that. It's like they understand what's getting ready to happen. But then as the, the judgment's being poured out upon them, they're not saying, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to do it. Give me another chance and I won't do it. No, it seems like they're mad at Him. They're just like total enemies of Him. They're just hard, their hearts are just hardened. Even though they're getting the wrath of God poured out on them, their heart is just hardened. Like Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh? He's just got all these plagues are coming out. And it's like you would think he would be like, okay, whatever, you know. But all he would do is just like temporarily say something like that so that it would be, uh, you know, the plague would be removed. And then he'd go right back to uh, persecuting God's people because his heart was hardened. His heart was hardened. <laughs> okay, so it continues. Chapter 16. <laughs> We'll eventually talk about the division. In, 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 there's like two sections of, uh, of this starting in Revelation chapter 12. But, but this is still kind of talking about the same, st same story in the, at this part. Revelation uh, 16 verse 9. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. It doesn't mean they didn't stop giving him glory. They repented not to give him glory. No, they repented not to give him glory. Like they should have been giving him glory, but they didn't. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Okay, they repented not to give him glory. And uh, look at, uh, yeah, let's just keep reading. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat uh, of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Okay? I won't explain. Uh, it talks about an angels uh, uh, pouring out judgment at that point too, but that's, we'll get there down the, down the line. Okay, so, uh, so what we see is once this uh, book is open, it's talking about the judgment of God that's fixing to come. And when that comes, it's pouring about some wicked people. All God's people are gone, and the people that are left have their hearts uh, just hardened. Now, I used to say, I don't think anybody gets saved during that time. Okay? And I, I still lean towards that, although I do see a few indications where perhaps uh, there is a remnant that even during that time gets saved. And I'll get to that down the, down the road because I'm not ready to talk about it yet. But, <laughs> but it will come. It will come up. And I think some people get saved during that point. But... Remember, at this point, God's people are out, and God's wrath is just being poured upon the, these people that are hardening their hearts, and they're not repenting, and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> all right, so what we want to look at is uh, the, this anticipation, okay, that's building up before these seals are open. And look, this has been prophesied from way back. And if you look at, let's go back all the way to... Uh, I mean, if you read, you know, everyone loves the book of Daniel, okay? You get through the first three chapters, there's these great stories, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, and, and they're, you know, like challenging the king, and, and all of those great stories. And then when you get to uh, chapter six, uh, chapter 7, it becomes 
all these like prophecies. And that's usually where people start droning out and they're like, hey, that's it, man. I can't read anymore. <laughs> the stories are gone. Now it's all prophecy. I can't read it. Now, I, I want to submit to you that after we get done with this series in Revelation, I mean, you could do it at any time if you want, but if when we get done with this series, if you go back and you read Daniel 7, 8, 9, all the way up to Daniel 12, it'll blow your mind the similarities to what we're reading in the book of Revelation. Okay, It's all there. It just lines up. And I'm going to give you an example real quick. Look at Daniel chapter 12. I'm going to, I don't want anybody, my mom's here, so I, I, I really shouldn't say this, but <laughs> everybody's like, what's going on? Don't worry about me, but if I'm like real slow finding things right now, I'm having one of those, what are they called? Ocular, ocular migraines. And what happens is everything gets real blurry. I don't know if anyone's ever had something like that. And so I'm just like, some of these words I'm not even seeing. Don't worry about me, okay? Valerie will drive home if, we, if she needs. <laughs> it's just something that happens every once in a while. Okay, Daniel chapter 12. Verse 9, all days uh, for me to say that. my mom. I picked the day that my mom's here. <laughs> Daniel chapter 12, look at verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from that time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be... For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Okay, so the very end of the book of Daniel is saying, hey, these things are shut up. And he's talking about this time period of uh, 1,000, I can't remember what it was, 1,360 years. Okay, and then it says, blessed are those who make it to, and then you add 45 I said years, didn't I? Days, sorry. Then you add 45 days to that, okay, and you've got 1,390. <laughs> I can't remember, huh? 35. Anyways, but the point is, these, these match up very well with the events that we're going to talk about. Now, so, so what Daniel was saying is from the time, uh, uh, from, from, from the time these events begin until the time that you see the... Uh, uh, abomination, desolation, okay? And we understand this. I'm, I'm getting way ahead and way too deep, but just bear with me. What we see this later on, this is going to be the uh, the midpoint, okay? And if you do that math right there, you're talking about three and a half years. And at that midpoint, there's the abomination, desolation. Then there's 45 more days, okay? That's what he talks about right there. If you make it to that, how did the end? Uh, oh, I already, I already lost my place. Uh, if you make it to that, blessed is he that makes it to that. What's that 45 days all about? Well, that is what we would call the Great Tribulation, okay? When uh, we see the abomination of desolation, and we'll read this at the, uh, at the end of the message. I'm going to read Matthew 24, and you'll see this. At, when we see that, we'll know, okay, that, the hey, just run. <laughs> just run. Get out of here. Because the Great Tribulation, like has never been before, is, is upon us, okay? And that's 45 uh, days. We can handle that, right? But a lot. Think about the harm that can be done in 45 days. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot. Uh, that's a lot of time, especially when you got someone in power who's empowered by the beast and has like ultimate authority, and and uh, and it's going to be it's going to be some terrible times. Okay, so uh, so the events that happen during this time are are talking about three and a half years. And then Daniel gives us nothing about the wrath of God that's going to be poured out. Okay, he literally stops right at that time after the Great Tribulation. 
When we read Matthew 24, we're going to say Jesus, uh, we're going to see that Jesus says the same thing. When they ask him, you know, Lord, tell us about the end times. He takes them up all the way until the time that the, I will, I'll show you is the time that the rapture happens. And he tells them nothing about the wrath that's going to be poured out after the Christians are gone. Now, what's interesting about that is <clears throat> most people that preach on prophecy today will tell you, oh, Daniel, that don't worry about that. That doesn't apply to you. You know, oh, the Mount of, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, he's talking to the disciples. That doesn't apply to you. You know, don't worry about that. Those things don't apply to you. And actually, the opposite is true. He tells us everything that applies to us doesn't tell us anything about what applies to the rest uh, of the earth that's going to get the wrath poured on them. Does that make sense? But when we get to Revelation, John gets this vision of what happens once the seals are open. And he begins to explain in detail about the wrath of God being poured out. Okay, but this message, uh, the, the sermon that, uh, the, here's all I wanted to get accomplished today. is I wanted to give you some of the background and get you thinking about that. But now I want to go through fairly quickly what these seven seals are. Okay, so let's go to Revelation 6. It's very important to understanding the end times prophecy that you get the difference between these seals and what happens when the book is finally open, right, after these seals have passed. Okay, so each time these seals pass, there's like an event that takes place, and John gets to see this event. So let's start with verse 1 and 2. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts. Remember those beasts, those cherubim, kind of creepy looking creatures that sound, from our perspective, with lightning and thunders and fire and all this kind of ter terrifying uh, vision here. And now he's going to hear uh, as the noise of thunder and the beast says, come and see. And I saw, and behold, now he's getting a vision. I don't know how literal to take this exactly, but he's, he's getting this vision about some, something that's going to represent some events that are going on is the way I understand this. Okay? And he sees a white horse, and he that sat on him, uh, on the horse, he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, in our minds, we would think, oh, white horse, here comes Jesus. He's riding on a white horse. He's got a crown. He's got a bow to conquer. But wait a minute. Jesus hasn't come yet. That's going to be quite obvious. And so doesn't it make sense then that who this is talking about, and most scholars agree with this, what this is talking about is not Christ, but it's a false Christ, right? The Antichrist. And so the Antichrist shows up, white horse, he's got a bow, he's, he's, he's given the, a crown, and he's going forth to conquer. So you see there, this idea of the bow is kind of, you think about like warfare, okay? This rise of war and the power that's given to this, uh, uh, to this creature, the Antichrist. And uh, verse, did I read verse 2 already? Yeah, verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there, there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat, upon, uh, sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And so uh, what we see right there is now a red horse, okay? And again, I don't know all the symbolism there, but here's, here's my perspective on, on the end times prophecy, right? When something can be taken literally, we take it literally. When something, we're kind of forced to read the symbolism there, like for instance, whenever he says, hey, there's, uh, there's these candlesticks, and then he says, now the candlesticks are the seven churches, right? And the stars are the angels of those churches, right? Now he's explaining to us what that symbolism is for. When you don't see the symbolism and you don't know what it means, it really doesn't help us any to just make over, to just overly speculate and start, you know, reading into that. And I'm going to tell you, the guys that want to sell prophecy books and make millions off of their uh, their theories of prophecy, they're going to spend all their time on these things that are really super unclear because they think they have some kind of enlightenment or whatever. But look, those things aren't necessary for us to know 
every little detail. So, uh, so all I know are there, there, we saw this white horse, and uh, when we follow that up with other scripture, which I, I will in a minute, we see that that's the Antichrist, okay? And, and, that, and that makes sense. We see this red horse, and in this red horse, he's got a sword, not a bow. You know, I think about a bow more like warfare, like, uh, you know, fighting from afar or whatever, and, and the power. We don't see a crown, anything like that, but we see that he's giving us, he's giving And in this sword, this, the rider of this red horse is able to take peace from the earth, and then we see uh, the earth uh, killing each other. How does it say it? It says, uh, uh, the red, his power was given uh, him to, that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Okay, now the third seal, number five, verse five. And we had, when he had opened the third seal, I heard the beast say, Come and see, and behold, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, uh, say, a measure of wheat for a penny. And if we compare other scriptures where Jesus gives parables about how much a penny was, we see that was like an entire day's wage. Okay, so $100, $200. I don't really know what the average uh, rate is today for a day's work of labor. But you're talking about all that for a, uh, for a measure of barley. And uh, see thou uh, hurt not the oil in the wine. And so you see this balance. And so you get the idea of everything that they're putting on the balances is weighed real carefully and it's super expensive. And so we, we can kind of look for that from that and see that probably kind of looks like uh, just a time of famine, a time of, you know, drought and you just don't have many resources. The price of everything's super high, probably because all the wars that we just read about. Uh, you know, the, that were, that were going to be taking place. And so at this point in the, you know, he's opening up the third seal. Now, remember, all this stuff t takes place three and a half years and then an additional 45 years. And then God's people are gone and all the events that happen once the book is open are God's wrath poured out. So that's another, you know, close to three and a half years. So all these seals are being opened in a three and a half year time time period. That's what Daniel said. That's what Jesus says. And this is what uh, John says right here. Okay, so really think about that three and a half years. That goes by pretty fast. <laughs> you know, when all these events, world war, you know, rise of the Antichrist, whatever that's going to look like. I think we can get a tiny little bit of a taste in our society today. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I, I didn't realize that I had my phone on the uh, uh, my location or something was turned on and so I didn't know Google was watching every little thing that I did and so all of a sudden I got a notification from Google saying well let, here's all your history of everywhere you've been this last month and it told me how many miles I've put on my car and it told me all, how many cities I've been in and how many places I've gone to and I'm thinking well I didn't really ask for that information but now I know that you know that information <laughs> <laughs> and you say, well, are you saying the Antichrist is? No, I'm just saying, can't you see how easily it is for all these things to happen and the rise of the Antichrist and a one world government and all the kind of things that we always relate to end times prophecy. And you're just like, man, I mean, it's there. I mean, my faith in the Bible has never been so strong, <laughs> you know, and then studying this stuff and realizing how, you know, thousands of years have passed and what he's saying matches up with what Jesus said is matching up with what Daniel said, you know, slightly different because they're not copying each other. They're seeing slightly different perspectives, but it all lines up and this should build our faith. And we should get really excited about when we see these things happening, you know, you say, well, I don't want persecution. I don't want persecution either. But if I see persecution happening to the church, I'm thinking this just falls right in place with what's going on. And I'm excited about that, <laughs> you know, all these people are like, I don't know why you want to go through the tribulation. That's the stupidest thing you can say. Nobody wants to go through tribulation. Have you ever heard somebody say that? And they're like, oh, you don't believe in a pre-trib rapture. What? If you want to go through the tribulation, you know, if you want to just uh, start uh, uh, getting in a bunker and, and storing up all this stuff, I'm like, nobody ever said that. <laughs> all we're saying is that the Bible says there's going to be great tribulation. And, uh, and if that happens... I'm going to be excited about it because I know that the end is super near. 
All right, so let's look at, now that's uh, four, no, three horses, all right? The fourth seal is open. We see the last, the, the final horse, and that's uh, chapter 6, verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed him, and power was given unto them uh, over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with beasts of the earth. That sounds like a pretty bad time. All right, verse 9. So there's no more uh, of the horses, but we still have some seals to open. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So doesn't it sound like to you that during these seals being opened, these are saints that are being slain for their faith and for their testimony in the Lord Jesus Christ? And, and so, uh, uh, so we see this, you know, now they're standing there saying, oh, we know it's coming. We know you're going to pour out your wrath. How long? <clears throat> and white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And obviously not everybody's going to be killed. A lot are going to go up in the rapture. So, uh, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a, tr a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks and in the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? So at this point, they're saying the great wrath of the Lord is fixing to come. Who shall be able to stand? So when the seventh seal is open... All right, we've gone through six seals, and you're like, well, what about the seventh seal? Well, when the seventh seal is open, immediately we're going to see God's wrath being poured out. So in that seventh seal, uh, that will be a, that will be a next lesson, okay? When that seventh seal, God's going to pour out His wrath, which means none of God's people are on the earth anymore, okay? We're not appointed unto wrath. We're all gone, and God will pour out His wrath upon the earth which had crucified the saints or, or persecuted the saints and had uh, done all manner of wickedness. These are the ones whose hearts are hardened. These are the ones who refuse to repent, even though uh, God's pouring out all this wrath on them for the final three and a half, a little bit less years. All right, now let's go to uh, Matthew 24 and see if these things check out. I already know they do, but let's look at it anyway. Matthew 24. Now, if I wanted to go any place in the Bible where I wanted to know something about the end times prophecy, it seems like I'd want to go to where the disciples asked Jesus, hey, tell us about end times prophecy, because <laughs> he's probably going to tell them, right? And people say, oh, no, no, that was a mystery. That was just to end times, uh, tribulation, Jew, uh, Jewish people that get uh, uh, converted in the tribulation or whatever. The problem is, I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. <laughs> so who came up with that idea? <clears throat> Here's what I see in Matthew 24, that he was Jesus is talking to the disciples who were saved, <laughs> who are going to be in the kingdom, uh, you know, ruling and reigning, and we're going to be ruling and reigning with them, according to the Bible, okay? They were saved people, so they weren't Jews. There's neither Jew nor Gentile in Christ, all right? So here's what he's saying to his disciples. 
who ask him about this. And Jesus answered and said unto them, verse 4, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, nowhere there does it say Antichrist. Antichrist. In fact, we read in 1 John, there's going to be many Antichrists. Okay? So, so I realize that Jesus isn't flat out saying, hey, the Antichrist will come, and blah, blah, blah. But he's saying, many will say, I am Christ. Okay? And we know from the Bible as well, in fact, in this chapter, he's going to say, and they're going to do many signs and wonders, right? So, I mean, you think right now the charismatic movement is growing and people are saying, hey, look, he's healing people and he's raising people from the dead and he's doing all this stuff. Yeah, there's going to, that same kind of uh, trickery, you know, that same kind of, uh, 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 you know, false signs and wonders are going to be done and these false prophets are going to be believed. And it says, if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So I'm going to say that's the first seal. That's the white horse right there. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You can say right there, that's a, maybe that red horse is coming, and it's, a, and, uh, it's got the sword, and it's, and it's killing people. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes and divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Doesn't that sound like that could be a time when, you know, it's going to cost uh, $100, $200 for a loaf of bread, <laughs> right? Because there's famine, there's pestilence. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, just the, I mean, look how we stocked up on toilet paper. And you couldn't go to the store and buy toilet paper because of this. Imagine how bad it's going to be, <laughs> right, when these days come. I mean, it actually is a third world war, and there's, uh, and there's persecution, and uh, you're not going to want to go out of your house. Forget the mask. You're not going to want to get out of your house because you don't have the mark of the beast. <laughs> you can't buy, sell, and trade. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I remember the day that the light bulb went off and I realized, you know, all these people were saying, no, see, it's about the works. If you're going to be saved, you've got to do the works. You know, you've got to endure to the end. And I remember thinking, what does that scripture mean? But when the light bulb went off and I realized in the context of what it's saying, it's saying, hey, you're going through tribulation, you're going through persecution, you're going through hard times, but guess what? You endure to the end of all those times, and you're going to be saved out of those hard times. <laughs> you're no longer going to be in that, that hard time because you're going up to heaven in the rapture, okay? I'll just kind of give you the, uh, uh, I'll open up the end of the book. <laughs> and the, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And I believe that the more... God's people start seeing persecution and start being challenged and start really even this even this very minor thing I, I think compared to the great tribulation uh, the pestilence that we're seeing right now and the uh, government mandates and stuff like that pretty minor pretty minor in the scheme of things right but even during this time what it's caused us to do is realize what's essential and what's not essential in the church Okay? And there's certain things that even we did in Iola that we're not doing anymore because it's just like that's not even really important. I'm just glad we're meeting. You know, I'm glad we're getting together. I'm glad we're continuing to go soul winning and doing the things that are important. I think that in this time where we would see uh, these heavy persecution coming and people actually dying for their faith in the reality that Christ is coming back really soon. Well, all of us right now, here's what people say. Well, if you believe, you know, that Christ isn't coming back until at least, you know, three and a half years, 
And what's going to stop you from just waiting to the last minute to get involved? You ever heard that argument? Like, like you're just telling people that he's not coming back at any moment, and so they're not going to do the works. That's okay. Maybe none of you guys have heard that, but I've heard people say that. Like, you're just you're you're telling people that you know not to be looking for his coming. And now here here's the thing. You know, maybe you're like that, but I see it more, more the other way around. I see people think that, hey, he could come back at any, any moment, but it's like they don't completely know when that's going to be because people have been saying that for so long that they don't have any urgency. <laughs> you know what I mean? And we shouldn't really put all of our stock into whether or not we serve the Lord based on, you know, when he's coming back anyway, right? But we should just constantly be doing the work of the Lord. But once you see tribulation, I can about guarantee you it's going to be so real to you that you know nothing else in this world is going to matter. You're going to be preaching the gospel to your loved ones. Hey, this is it. You guys don't understand. They're going to say, hey, you're nuts. I'm going to turn you in. And, uh, <laughs> you know, why didn't you receive that mark of the beast anyway? I don't understand. <laughs> it's going to get really bad. But the gospel is going to go into the, into the whole world more than ever. Technology is already there. It could go into the world faster and better than ever before in the sense of... Uh, 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 you know, the internet and all that. And now look at this. This is the, the midpoint of the, this seven-year time period. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of the desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that give uh, uh, that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days be sh uh, should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days should be short, shall be shortened. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe him not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they say unto you, uh, Behold, he is in the desert, Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For, tell me if this sounds like the rapture. As the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. Can you picture in your head, like, uh, uh, and don't get hung up on the word eagles there, right? The word in 1600s, uh, they, they didn't have you know, all these different words for these different types of species of birds, okay? Can you imagine roadkill? And when that roadkill, uh, you know, when nobody's around and you got that roadkill on the road, nobody's around, and all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, these buzzards or whatever kind of animals come and just, right? Now, that seems kind of weird to talk about Jesus as, like, roadkill or something. But what he's saying is, just like that, where the carcass is, the eagles are should be gathered. He's saying, hey, that's going to be like the coming of Christ. It's, it's just like lightning shines from the, uh, from the west and, and the scene in the east. I mean, super fast, Christ is coming, and all of God's people are, whoosh. I mean, this has got to be talking about uh, the rapture, okay? And then, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of, of heaven with power and great glory. Now that exactly lines up with that part at the end of the chapter where the men are saying, whoa, we're in trouble. And they're, and they're running to hide themselves in the caves and in the dens, and they're saying the mount, for the mountains to fall on them. Right? They're mourning because the great day of the wrath is coming. So the, so the seals have been removed, okay, and we see that that's about three and a half years 
And we're, and, and I say we're, you know, I mean, talking about saved people in general, the elect, that's the terminology Revelation used, and, and uh, Matthew 24 used, the servants of God, they're here through that time, through these seals. But then we're gone. And once we're gone, there's silence in the space of heaven for about an hour, and then a uh, half hour, and then pff, the, the, the wrath of God's going to be poured out on us. Hope that makes sense. To me, that was the moment when I saw all that and saw how it all fit together. It was just like, psh, it all makes sense now. Like, I understand, like, why people get confused on certain, uh, certain things. Because we are out of here before the wrath of God's poured out, right? But we also go through tribulation. So you're like, I remember as a kid thinking, well, some people believe you go through the tribulation. Well, yeah, because you do. <laughs> but we're not appointed under wrath. That's right, because we're gone before the wrath. Wait, but I thought that we're going. To, we're not in the tribulation. No, we're in the tribulation. But we, you understand what I'm saying? There's confusion out there because they just heard all these different things, but they haven't actually read the Bible and saw it for themselves. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, for your word and uh, and and just actually making it very clear. Again, not saying that I have it all figured out. I pray that you continue to give me understanding and give all of us understanding about how these things take place but i thank you that you didn't leave us without any understanding of what's going to happen but you laid them out for us in several places in the bible and i pray that none of our faith would be shaken uh as we uh don't see these things come to pass because actually we we, we see more and more every day how these things could come to pass so quickly and escalate very quickly and Lord, as we see the beginning of these things, as you called it, the uh, beginning of sorrows, uh, help us to get excited and not to get uh, bitter and to focus on current events and politics and, and, and all that, because we know our hope's not in any of that. Our hope is in you. And I pray, Lord, that you give us the grace and uh, give us a zeal and a burden to win souls and preach the gospel and uh, get our lives uh, right and holy before you. And, uh, and I pray that you'll just bless this church and the work we do and, uh, and all your people around the earth, uh, world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.